uh, that challenge is this new medium of, you know, uh, a book in the vernacular that a anybody can read. Uh, that, that was unacceptable. And what is interesting is that new media can, can sometimes, you know, broaden and democratize and, you know, uh, uh, authority. And at the other times, it can, um, it can narrow uh, authority. So in the case of um, the sound recordings of, of, of Chazanus, uh, really started to narrow the sense of uh, the repertoire and uh, uh, the nusach uh, uh, because the, the sound recording started to drive uh, the expectations of congregations of what they wanted. They wanted everybody wanted their candor to sound like Jessica Rosenblatt and uh, or, or, or the other handful of of, of Chazanim who recorded and. Uh, that started to uh, 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 shape in a more limiting way rather than a more expansive way uh, uh, authority as a result of this new medium. Another question was raised about you know, morality uh, uh, and, and, and new media practices. Uh, uh, is there something inherent in these new media that uh, is a challenge to morality? And um, uh, this is, um, you know, it's not a new concern. It's also not only a concern among Jews. And uh, these debates that emerged about, uh, emerged about the raw advent of movies and of radio and television, uh, they all engendered public debates about whether there was something inherent in the new media that was undermining morals. And here um, I, I find the response of uh, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, uh, uh, the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, uh, who was a real champion uh, very early on in his uh, leadership of using uh, uh, new technologies. Uh, so, for example, broadcasting lessons in Tanya on the radio in the 1950s. And when they, they, when they did this, you know, uh, other, you know, they, you know uh, they, they were widely denounced, you know, uh, among other, you know, Hasidim and Orthodox Jews said this, you know, you're, uh, you're doing something really sacrilegious and there's something in, in, inherently, uh, uh, you know, corrupt about, about this, this, this medium. And, you know, look, look what else is on the radio. And his response was, you know, there's nothing inherently good or bad in this technology. It is God-given, like everything else our ability to create it, and therefore the, the challenge is uh, whether it's used for good or for ill. And whether one understands that as, you know, as, as a, uh, a logical way of framing it or as a humanistic way of framing it, uh, I, I think that that's a, actually a very thoughtful way to check some of the um, conversations that people have about, uh, uh, about media and to think about, you know, this is, this is the, the proving ground is in how these things are used. Uh, the relationship of virtual to real experience. Will, will the virtual undermine the real? And this is also not new. Uh, there was a big concern, for example, when um, uh, they started broadcasting uh, symphony concerts and operas on the 1930s. And people said, you know, why, why would they go, you know, pay good money to go to the opera, go to a symphony concert when you can listen to the radio for free? Turns out that was a bad argument, that that actually encouraged people to then, who would never have thought of going to a symphony or an opera, to see the actual event, that uh, the, uh, a new perception of the real can enhance rather than undermine its importance. And uh, the, the, there's a new um, uh, uh, significance attached to actually being there. Uh, we see this, for example, in... Uh, Holocaust tourist practices, where, you know, you have these testimonies from people who say, you know, I saw movies and I read books and I went to museums, but then I went to, uh, uh, you know, Auschwitz and, you know, now I know what it was like because I was actually there. And, of course, now the challenge for me as a teacher is to say, well, you were there as a tourist. So your, your experience is actually a mediated experience, too. But the being there has been uh, given a kind of privilege status uh, because it has been enhanced by uh, uh, the uh, attraction of being there in response to all these uh, mediated encounters. And uh, this is, by the way, engendered a very interesting set of halakhic discussions of the theological significance of being there. So, um, you know, when, you know when people have said, like, can you have a virtual minion? Can somebody log in on the minion? And, no, you can't. And then, of course, the question is, well, why not? And what emerges is a very interesting discussion about uh, the, you know, the need to have 
10 souls which are in 10 bodies and the relationship of body soul is like now there's a, you know that that gets explored by you know people responding in ligand to the possibility of you know you know phoning in your 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 participation in in, in a minion on the other hand other practices like the Chavrusa, that's fine so the the, the, uh, uh, the opportunity for considering new uh, halakhic questions that have very interesting you know philosophical implications also emerging from real and virtual uh, undermining traditional tech skills uh, was another uh, concern, and uh, uh, this also is, is is not a new concern if we consider the long-standing discussion about the relationship of the oral to the written in uh, a traditional uh, uh, study. Uh, I, I would say that you know the the, the impact is really uh, uh, is significant, and it, it is something that really uh, requires attention. And I I remember when in mid 1990s. Uh, going to office of a, a professor of mine at Columbia where I was uh, getting my PhD and uh, I needed him to sign a form and I couldn't get his attention because the department had just gotten the uh, the shots on a, on a, on a CD-ROM, you know, the, the earliest iteration of this and he had it in his computer and he was glued to the screen and he was just fascinated with it and he's playing with it and he's searching and he's, and, and he's sitting there and he's just completely overtaken by it and he says, this is changing everything. He said, David White, tell Livni's going to be out of a job. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, this is the end of every edition. And I remember standing there thinking, you know, I could have an argument with you about this now, but I just need you to sign the form. <laughs> and, but thinking, he's not out of a job, but his job is going to change. And that what we see is, you know, uh, you know the long-standing dependence on memorization is being challenged. Uh, it can foreground intellectual engagement with the text, but, you know, the teacher is still needed because the teacher has to, uh, uh, you know, there still is a need. This is not, I have to tell you, this is not a text that you can just walk into without guidance. And I'm, I'm intrigued by the packaging on some of the, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, digital versions of, uh, of the shops where they say, you know, even a novice, in a, you know, in a few minutes, you can be doing the most advanced and sophisticated searches, and I'm thinking only if you know what you're looking for, right? And so teachers need to acknowledge this and accommodate these new technologies. It will, uh, you know, the, the implications are, are uh, uh, very important, and uh, in the same way that, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm often asked, like, how I feel about, you know, the, the word processor has changed uh, writing, and I say I think it makes good writers better and it makes bad writers worse. I I think the same thing will be true of of, of, of common scholars is that you know the, the that there will need to be a pedagogical accommodation of uh, that is a shift in priorities uh, uh, that, that that deals with this new technology. Uh, the uh, last question that was raised, and I'll wrap up with this, was the need to acquire new skills these are the old skills for both. And this absolutely is something that is needed, and I think one of the challenges of negotiating students' greater facility uh, with new media, because greater facility does not necessarily mean that they um, have uh, uh, literacy. Uh, so I, uh, you know, uh, uh, when I teach about uh, using websites, and I ask students, you know, how do you assess a website? And they don't know what I mean by that. I, and I say, well, here's a book. I pick up a book. I say, here's how I assess a book as somebody who spent a lot of time books. I look at the name of the author. I look at who published it, where and when it was published. I read the acknowledgments and see, you know, who this person, you know, studied with, uh, you know, reference. I look at the footnotes. I look at the index. I, you know, I, I scan the introduction. I say, what? There's no footnotes? Well, I'm starting to get a little nervous here, right? So that's how I assess a book to figure out, you know, where it's coming from and how, you know, you know what its quality is, you know, as an authoritative source if it's coming from a particular position, from a discipline review. I said, how do you do that with a website? And they look absolutely baffled. And I said, you know, the first thing you do is you look for the about us, right? Which is like opening the book to see, you know, who published it and who wrote it and, who, you, know, uh, uh, you know, who edited it and so on and so forth. And I said, and if you can't find that, you've got to wonder what you're looking at. And, uh, and then 
other ways of thinking about that this is uh, uh, that one needs to develop a kind of uh, a critical skill for evaluating uh, uh, this new medium that are uh, rooted in the same kind of uh, a attention to figuring out you know where something comes from, where its ideas come from, what, what you know, on what it draws its authority, uh, who's paying for it, uh, uh, to to whom might it be behold ideologically, politically, or what have you. Uh, this is something that you know one has to figure out, and because it's a new medium, uh, it's a tricky business. 